Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here this morning as we come together to gather to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit would be with each and every single one of you, empowering you in your worship today and transforming your hearts and your lives for our Lord Jesus Christ. And so looking at the announcements today, there, uh, there's one new announcement that I just want to let us know, and that is that uh, Reverend Dr. Craig Brown from the conference, um, he will be visiting us on Sunday, April 3rd. That's our first uh, Sunday of worship for our combined service um, for that Sunday. And he is currently serving as the Executive Director of Congregational Development for the California Nevada Conference. And being, being that uh, he serves in this position and my role at the conference, he's actually the guy that I work with the most at the conference. I don't actually work with the DS the most. It's actually uh, Reverend Dr. Craig Brown that I work with the most at the conference. And so he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he also came from the, the, he and I, we both share the similarities that he also came from the Alliance that, as I did. And so uh, we have that, that same passion for evangelism and uh, discipleship. And so uh, I'm excited to have him be here with us. I mean, we've been talking about this for the past two, three years since he started serving in this position. And uh, he hasn't had a chance to come, but uh, he, he did contact me, I believe it was last week, and he said that he is coming this time, so he just wants to meet all of you. So uh, be ready for that. And I don't see any other new announcements in here. Does anybody else have any other announcements that you would like to share? I, ha I have one. Uh, Educator of the Year committee members, we have a meeting after church today in the social hall, so please come by and anybody else is welcome to join. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody who has signed up to be greeter and coffee hour hostess. I know that there, there are little extra things that have to be done for those, but I do appreciate it, and I know that everybody who uh, comes in and then stays for coffee hour really appreciates it too so thank you there's always room on the uh, um, papers to put more names so feel free they're out there on the table thank you thank you so much Anna. any more announcements at this time okay I don't see any more announcements so if you can stand with me please do so and please join me for the call to worship that is in the bulletin as followers of Jesus Christ living in this world, which some seek to control, but which others view with despair, uh, despair we declare with joy and trust. From the beginning through all the crises of our times until his kingdom fully comes. God is king, let the earth be glad. The Spirit is at work, renewing the creation. Praise the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, our world belongs to you. Turn your hymnals to page 64. Page 64, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you so much for gathering us here this morning before your holy throne. Lord, we ask, we ask for your presence to be here with us. We ask that you rain down upon us with your grace and with your love, allowing us to see who you are this morning, Lord. So we lift everyone here up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. And we are going to have, uh, the first is going to have be a choir anthem from the mall. And then after that, we'll be having a special song from uh, Shisha's mom. Okay?
Okay, Lucia, no children, no chance. She's going to have a special song for us. Thank you so much for sharing that song with us here today. Uh, the um, hymn that was sung by uh, the Hmong choir is about, uh, of course, about remembering Jesus Christ. And so the chorus says, I will remember Gethsemane. I will remember that Christ died for me. And I will remember his love that he gave his life for me. And so that's what the song is about, and just remembering Christ on this special day. And so yeah, at this time, um, at this time, we'll be hearing the Old Testament reading from Alma. So Alma. Aren't we blessed to have... Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Aren't we blessed to have these beautiful voices as part of our congregation? Uh, you can tell when they're singing that uh, they love and ha are very passionate about our Lord, so we are very blessed. Our first um, test Old Testament reading today is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. The year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the temple was filled with his glory. Hovering about him were mighty six-winged seraphs. With two of their wings, they covered their faces. With two others they covered their feet, and with two they flew. In a great antiphonal chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Such singing it was. It shook the temple to its foundations, and suddenly the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. Then I said, My doom is sealed, for I am a foul-mouthed sinner a member of a sinful, foul-mouthed race. And I have looked upon the king, the lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphs flew over to the altar and with a pair of tongs picked out a burning coal. He touched my lips with it and said, Now you are pronounced not guilty because this coal has touched your lips. Your sins are all forgiven. Then I heard the lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go? And I said, Lord, I'll go, send me. The words of our Lord to the people of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand with me if you're able to. Turn your hymnals to page 593. This is one of my favorite hymns in all of the hymnal book. Here I am, Lord. 593. Yes, I will. <laughs>
Praise the Lord. You may be seated at this time. It's time for us to share our joys and our concerns and our prayer requests at this time. Uh, just want to encourage all of us to continue to pray for Tim McGraw. I did get a message from uh, Raiden a couple of days ago that he is now home, but in a, also he is in hospice care. Uh, so please continue to pray for both Raiden and for Tim. Not only that, also pray for Chow Tao. Uh, he is, uh, his entire family, they did test it positive for COVID-19. Uh, they haven't been, been to church for a while. They, they did test positive for COVID-19. The rest of the family is doing well, but Chow is in the hospital at this time. And uh, I mean, he does, uh, he does have asthma, so it's something that's, uh, that's difficult on him at this time. And uh, I spoke with his wife this morning. She said that uh, it's hard for him to, to just breathe. It's hard for him to just move around. Chow, chow chow. Yeah, so uh, please pray for Chow and also for his family. And um, at this time, if you have any joys, concerns, any requests that you would like us to pray for, please share them. Simon is doing well. I mean, he's, um, he's, he was at work last night. He, he is doing well. I mean, uh, we are trying to get him into therapy. He doesn't think that he needs it, but uh, we're trying to get him into that. Thank you for asking. All right over here with Luis. I do see Bev here with us this morning. Bev, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm concerned about my daughter. My daughter has just passed a um, uh, uh, flight steward, stewardess, steward. And um, she's flown out yesterday. I haven't heard where she's gone. This is her first flight. I don't know where she is or where she's gone yet. <laughs> so I'm a little concerned about her. Um, she's 54 years old, and she's just becoming a flight attendant. First of all, what is her name, Louise? What? What is her name? Marty. Marty? Marty uh, Van Von Kampen. What, what, what was that? Marty. Marty. M A R T Y. Okay. Prayers for Marty. Well, I started when I was 19. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, mention a, um, the reason that Pat and Willie aren't here is that they're quarantining uh, in, in their home. So uh, uh, Lily has COVID. She got, you know, they both are teachers, so they, can't, they get all those germs. Um, but they're doing fine, she said. We'll see you next Sunday. Uh, and I also want to say hi, Adrian. She's out there. <laughs> Good to see her, even with a mask on. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bev? My brother-in-law, Mike Cawthorn, has bladder cancer, and I'd like to ask for prayers for uh, Mike. For Mike, is that it? Mike, uh-huh. Okay. Prayers for Mike. I just want to pray for my mother-in-law, Kavain. She's been having these uh, weird noises through her ears, and it's been bothering her a lot. So please pray for her. Okay, prayers for Ka. Anyone else at this time? Sang in the back. 
I just want to um, pray for my dad. He uh, had a um, high blood pressure, so it's really high. So I just want to say some prayers to him and uh, and, and my mom. She's sick too, so I pray. Said pray for her too, and I said pray for everyone here too as well. Amen. To that. Thank you, Frank. So Shisha is, is in her last semester of law school, and so uh, that's the prayer that uh, her mom is asking us for to support her, to pray for her as she goes through her last semester in law school. And she also uh, wanted to praise the Lord because uh, she's, she said she's had diabetes for a long time, and for the past couple of months she's been drinking some tea, and that's been helping her, and her diabetes has, has gone down. So praise the Lord for that. Any, anything else? Anyone else? Okay, let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for just bringing us here together. What a wonderful thing it is. What a blessing it is to have each other, to be in each other's presence as we come together to speak of our joys and our concerns and the things that we are going through, the trials and the difficult times, Lord. And yet, even though we go through all these different times and different situations, Lord, we know that you are always good. We know that you're always on your throne. We know that you are holy indeed, Lord, and we can put our faith in you. In times of distress, Lord, we can come to you knowing that you will comfort us. In times of great joy, Lord, we know that we can come to you and that you will celebrate our joy with us, Lord. And we thank you so much for these things. We also thank you so much for each other, Lord. Just having each other here, just being with each other here, gathering here this morning to worship, it is such a great thing. It is such an inspiring thing for us to just be among Christian brothers and sisters and just to be able to talk and give testimony about our faith and our situation and our journey and just to be able to hear these songs being sung to us this morning, remembering who your son Jesus Christ is, the suffering that he's given to us, just hearing these songs talking about love, just loving one another, just hearing these passages, these, these scriptures in which you call us to your ministry, Lord. And we thank you so much for these things. And as we read these scriptures, also remind us, Lord, that just as the Apostle Paul once reminded the church at Corinth that all that we do, Lord, all that we do here is about your son, Jesus Christ. It is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the suffering that he gave for us, the sacrifices that he gave for us, redeeming us and just saving us from the bondage of our own sins, Lord. We thank you so much for these things. As we come before you these, this morning, Lord, we, we lift up all these prayer requests, all these joys, all these concerns up to you, Lord. We ask that you grant us strength where we need strength, Lord. We ask that you grant us peace and comfort where, where that is needed. We ask that where healing is needed, Lord, that you will grant us healing, Lord, and that you will be with us and that you will testify about your love among us and you will work through us. Let us be that light into this community, just empowering us and, and allowing us to just Continue to give our testimonies about you throughout this entire community, being that light that just shined upon this community, shining your love and your grace upon each and every single person here in this community, Lord, for your word has taught us that every single person is of value to you because every person is created in your image, Lord. And we thank you so much for all the things that you have given to us. And so at this time, we pray the prayer that your son, Jesus Christ, once taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'll be hearing the New Testament reading, and as uh, Alma is reading the New Testament from the passage from the New Testament, I'm going to be right in the back there to grab my communion. Oh, my communion stuff is right there. Never mind. <laughs> so, Alma, all you. <laughs> I am reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. 
uh, Paul is talking to us, just as he did to his brothers and sisters in Corinth. Now let me remind you, brothers, of what the gospel really is, for it has not changed. It is the same good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and still do now, for your faith is squarely built upon this wonderful message, and it is this good news that saves you if you still firmly believe it, unless, of course, you never really believed it in the first place. I passed on to you right from the first what had been told to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said he would, and that he was buried, and that three days afterwards he arose from the grave just as the prophets foretold. He was seen by Peter and later by the rest of the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 Christian brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Then James saw him and later all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him too, long after the others, as though I had been born almost too late for this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, you okay? No running. Huh? As Eli was running down here, he fell down. It reminds me of a reminds me of a long time ago, about 10, 10, 15 years ago, when um, Simon was still probably about four or five years old, and we went to uh, Fresno for a. Uh, for a youth conference, and we were in a big, big auditorium, right, about 2,000 people. And Simon, Simon went out, went, he went to the restroom, and then as he came in, to the, as he came back into the auditorium, he opened up the door and, and he said in a loud voice, because that's a big auditorium, so there's a big echo, right? So he says, I'm back, and it echoed throughout the whole entire auditorium, and that was right in the middle of uh, the pastor's sermon, too, and everybody just started laughing. And the pastor stopped, the, the pastor stopped, he paused, and he says, I didn't even know he was gone. And so everybody started laughing, so that reminded me of that. <laughs> and so and it was a wonderful time. That's many, many years ago, probably back in 2005, 2006, somewhere around there. So uh, at this time, it is time for us to um, enter into our order of communion. And so if you do have your hymnals, please turn to page 9. And um, we will be reading from page 9 and page 10 and 11. So join me. Up there where it says, the Lord be with you. If you're there, let us start together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You form us in your image and breathe into us the breath of life. When we turn away and our love fails, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. And we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. It's always difficult to open these. I am trying here. <laughs> Give me a minute. Okay, there we go. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Jesus Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ given for you. Let us take the elements together. If you may, join me for the closing prayer where it says, Eternal God. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The lectionary this year has been taking us through the book of Corinthians, which is a good thing. I do enjoy the book of Corinthians a lot. It talks a lot about, I mean, the, the things that often happen in the church, division, things of that sort, and issues and troubles and all kinds of disagreements that happens in the church, right? It's not something that is just for us nowadays, but it was something that was an issue for even the early church and this week, we are now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through verse 11. And those very, very, that very, very first Bible verse up there in which the Apostle Paul starts out in that letter here in chapter 15, he says, I want, you, uh, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preach to you. What a wonderful message it is. What a wonderful thing it is for the Apostle Paul to just remind the church after all the things that the church has gone through, after all the things that the Apostle Paul addressed in this letter, all the things that he talked about, the things about unity, the things about accountability, the things about diversity and the celebration of diversity, the things about pursuing love, which was in chapter 13. After talking about all these things, and he comes to the end of this chapter, and he says, I want to remind you of this. I want to remind you what all of this is about. We are doing all these things. We, we are seeking unity. We are seeking accountability. We are celebrating our diversity. We are pursuing love. And we're doing all these things because of the gospel that I have preached to you. And so he ends this letter by reminding them of that gospel and sometimes that's what we need sometimes we need that more than anything else because as we go through the frustrations of life as we go through the frustrations of doing ministry as we go through pandemics as we go through difficulties as we go through trials disagreements in the church as we go through all these things 
Sometimes the thing that we forget is that this is about Jesus Christ. And we always need leaders, leaders such as the Apostle Paul, who has that heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ, who will come back to us and says, look, I know you've gone through a lot. I know, I know your church has, has many disagreements. I know your church has many different cliques and, and many different groups in that church. I know your church has so many different cultures and ethnicities in that church. I know this. And I, I know that, that, that maybe you've even been hurt by the church, right? I know, I know all these things, but I just want to remind you here that this is about Jesus Christ, that it all comes down to this. It is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the very reason why we seek for unity. This is the very reason why we seek for these things. And Apostle Paul, as we read his letters and as we, we, we look at his life, we can see the passion that he had for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was so convinced in this gospel of Jesus Christ. He was convicted in his heart about this gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew for himself that this gospel was the power of God that brings salvation to him. He knew that because he experienced it on the road to Damascus. He saw and he experienced how his life changed because of Jesus Christ coming to him and calling him and redeeming him. You know, when Joan, when Joan passed away, I had a chance to just sit down with those who knew Joan. And, and the one thing that they all told me was this, that the gospel changed her life. Knowing Jesus Christ changed her her life. And that is such a wonderful thing. I know that in, even in my own personal life, I know the power of the gospel itself that it has changed my life also. It is such a supernatural experience. Sometimes you just simply cannot explain what happens, and all you do know is that it happens, that when Christ comes, something changes inside of us. And that's something that we cannot forget. We need to be reminded of so many times in our lives that we must not forget about the power of the gospel. I know so many times we depend on all these other ideas out there, but Paul is saying here, don't forget about this. This is the one thing that is going to change you. This is the one thing that's going to keep you together. This is the one thing that keeps you sane. You know, we were talking about my son, I've had to ask about my son, and I really do appreciate that. One of the things I talked about my son as he's going through his own issues now, being on him, being out there in the world by himself, being at school by himself, is that remember your faith in Christ, right? No matter what you're going through, you're going to school, you're having, you know, you're struggling, you're having issues there. And I know you're having issues at workplace, but remember your faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's what keeps us going. That's what always keeps us going. Sometimes we forget about our faith. Many times we often think that, that the Christian faith is just another religion out there, especially here in the culture of the West. We often think that, that, that it's just another religion no different than anything else. And many times when, when we have that such, that such a laid back, such a casual attitude towards our own faith, we hurt our own Christian testimony more than anybody else because there's that lack of spiritual conviction in us. And we can't have that. We, we need to be convinced. We need to be convicted of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as the Apostle Paul and the, early, the, the leaders of, of the early church, and how, how convinced and how convicted they were of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we see all these other people in, in other parts of the world, and they take their, their faith so seriously, the Buddhists, the Muslims, the shamans, even the Baal shamans, they take their faith as a way of life. But so many times we often approach our faith as just another religion on the side. But the Apostle Paul is reminding us here that it, it's not just another religion. That this that we do about the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is, it's not something that you come and you try it, and if it doesn't work, then you can go and try something else. That's not the message that the Apostle Paul was trying to remind us of. But instead, Paul was convinced that this was the absolute truth. He was convinced that there is no alternative to this faith at all. He was convinced that there was no other philosophy at his time that measures up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was convinced that there was no religion, no social theory, no political ideology 
that can measure up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew that this was not something that people just sat around and one day they came up with after many, many hours of deliberations and debates. But he knew and he was convinced that this was the truth. And that's why he dedicated so much of his life to this gospel. And I often say this and it often gets me in trouble. But you know, I would rather have one person that is on fire for God than a thousand people who has no conviction in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know one said this in a church, and they say, look at that pastor. He doesn't want a lot of members in his church. That's not the point. That's not the point. One person who is on fire for God will be able to do so much more for the kingdom of God than a thousand people who has no conviction at all, and they just attend church every Sunday. And this is what we need. We need men. We need women. We need youth. We need children who are convinced and convicted of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as the apostles were, just as the apostle Paul was. We need men like that who would go out there and they would proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. You see, in verse 20, Paul says that Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. He says this and he stated this with much conviction and with absolute certainty. That this is what happened, that Christ did raise, that Christ was raised from the death, from the dead. Verse 4 through verse 8, we see Paul establishing the resurrection as a historical, factual event. He wasn't saying, no, this is something that I heard. He wasn't saying that this is something that I just believe in. But he was saying that this is actually something that happened. It is fact. It is a historical fact that it happened. And from verse 4 to verse 8, he says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. And then he goes on in verse 5, he says, he appeared to Cephas, who was Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. You see, Paul is saying here, by saying, making these statements, as he introduces, as he reminds them of the gospel once again, he goes back and he establishes the resurrection of Jesus Christ as something that actually happened. He's not saying, he's, he's, he's not saying this is just something that we, that we believe in. This is just another Greek mythology, an, an idea, a, a myth that, about Jesus Christ. But he is saying that this is something that actually happened. And we have many witnesses that are still among us today. They saw the resurrected Christ. The apostles, when he, talk, he refers to Cephas, he's talking about Peter and the disciples. And he then ends by saying, I myself also saw this Jesus Christ. So he's establishing this to them as the church. He's saying this is real. This is the truth. And because of that conviction, we see Paul's life. We see his his life reminding us of what it means to be convinced in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this is real. In Philippians chapter 1, he says that I am in chains for Christ. That he was so convicted of the truth of Jesus Christ that he was willing to give up his own life for that gospel of Jesus Christ. That even when he, they, they put him in chains for Christ, that he was, he was okay with that. He was okay with that. It was worth it because he saw the living Jesus Christ. He saw the living God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, He says, I am being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Oh, it's near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Towards the end of his life, he said, it's all worth it. All the troubles that he went through, everything that he went through, he said, it's all worth it. I've done everything that I can. And here I am, I am nearing death. But yet I've done everything that I can for the gospel that saved him, that saved him. 
And he saw the power of that gospel in his own life. He saw the power of that gospel in so many people that he preached to. And he was so certain that that was the truth. And then goes on, he says that this is a gospel that is something that we are to receive. It is not something to be inherited through tradition. It is not something to be inherited through our clans. It is not something to be inherited through our family lineage. And so many times that's the trouble in the, the American churches is that we often think that this is something that we, we receive because it's part of our tradition for so long. I know we often talk about the, the people movement of Laos in the, in the 1950s when thousands of Hmong people came to Christ. But there was a problem in that that we, we don't see. And the problem is that, in that is that so many, many people came to Christ because of their clan leaders, because of their clans that came to Christ. And so they had no other choice but to come to Christ because they knew that if I don't come to Christ, my clan's not going to, my clans are, they're probably going to disown me. And so I need to come to Christ. So they were forced to come to Christ. And many people, they came to Christ, not because they received the gospel, because they came, but they came to Christ because their families came to Christ, because their leaders came to Christ. And, and so for the last, since the 50s, all the way until now, for the last 60 to 70 years, we spent so much time inside the church converting people who have never received the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they just started coming to church because they had no other choice. And in the context of every ministry, every culture, every ethnicity, we have this issue because we don't realize that the gospel is something that is to be received. It is not something that is inherited. And it is to be received by faith. It is to be received by faith. You see, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 9 to verse 6. Um, Verse 6 to verse 8, he says, For not, who, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. You see? Because they thought that just because they were children or they were offsprings of Abraham, they, that the, they can trace their family lineage to Abraham, that they are a people, they, they are now a, per, a person or a people of faith. But, but Paul is saying, telling them here that, no, no, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they, they all uh, Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are God's children. You see, it is something that we don't inherit just because we're born into that family just because we're born into that culture. But it's something that we must receive. We must receive through faith. See, Paul, by tradition, he was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee by tradition. And he believed that he was doing God's will by persecuting the church, by persecuting the early Christians. But yet, in the end, he realized this. He realized that he was not doing God's will at all, that he needed to also receive Christ. Receive the gospel by faith. And the scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews, it says that it is by faith that Abel brought a better offering. It is by faith that Enoch did not experience death. It is by faith that Noah built an ark. It is by faith that Abraham left his home and went to a place, a land that he had no idea where he was going. It is by faith, by faith, by faith that we receive this promise. It is by faith that we receive this gift. The word receive implies that it is a gift that God has given to us. And each and every single one of us, your parents can't receive this for you. Your pastor can't receive this for you. Your lay leader cannot receive this for you. Your bishop cannot receive this for you. Your DS cannot receive this for you. It is something that you must receive for yourself. You must receive it from God and take it. God is offering this gift. Now it's up to you. No one else can receive it. You must be the one to receive it. And Paul reminds them of that, that you have received it. I have given this to you. And it is upon this that you must take a stand. You see, unlike the church at Galatia, and we're going to study the book of Galatia here in a few
few weeks here because, you know, I, I just enjoyed that, that book. But, you know, if we look at the church of Galatia, we see that the church of Galatia, they were abandoning the gospel. But here the church of Corinth, even though they're going through all these issues, they were still taking a stand. They still held on firmly to this gospel. They still knew this gospel. They haven't changed the gospel to fit their desires. They, they haven't changed the gospel to simply accommodate them. They were still holding on to this pure gospel as taught by the apostles and by, by Paul himself. At the Galatian church, it was totally different. The Galatian church, they were just taking anything that sounded good to them. They didn't know the gospel anymore. They were confused. They had teachers in their church that was taking them in, in every si different directions when it comes to the gospel, and they were quickly becoming confused. And that's why Paul says to them in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to verse 7, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. And so this is the lesson for the church today. As Paul says that we are to hold firmly and to take a stand and the gospel. And the message and the lesson for the church today is that no matter what we are going through, no matter what we may be facing at this time, even as we face the division of the United Methodist Church, that the one thing that we must do is we must take a stand upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we must hold firmly to this gospel. We must not forsake it. We must not leave it. We must not water it down. We must not mix it with other religions, mix it with other ideologies. But we must hold firmly to it. That's what the Apostle Paul says, hold firmly to it. He says, you know, you can compromise with all these other issues, but when it comes down to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when he talks about holding firmly onto it, in verse 58, he goes on and he says, stand firm in it. He says, let nothing move you away from it. He says, to offer your lives fully to, to serving the Lord. When he talks about these things, he is simply saying that there must be no compromise in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can compromise in all these other things, traditions. We, we, we've studied this before. We, we've talked about this before. When, when the Gentiles was coming to, to Christ and the Jewish people, they, they wanted this, the, the Gentiles to get circumcised. And Paul says, no, we can compromise on that. Right? Things of the laws, we can compromise on that. Things of tradition, Paul, Paul says, yeah, let, let's compromise on that. But there is one thing that as the church, that as Christians, that we must never compromise on. And that's what Paul is saying here, is that we must never compromise on the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, we can change our liturgy, but we should not change the message of the gospel. But yet, you know, many times in the church, we have a tendency to hold on to traditions more so than to hold on to the gospel and the message of Christ. Many times, we will not change the way we do liturgy, but when it comes to the gospel, we're absolutely fine changing the message of the gospel. Many times, we, we will not change the way that we make decisions in the church, but you know what? We're, we're, it's open season on the gospel so many times. So many times in the church, we will not even change the color of the light bulbs in our sanctuary. But man, when it comes to the gospel, guess what? That can be removed anytime. You know, I go to some old churches. I go to some old churches, and many churches have no one in the pews anymore. And you often talk to them, and, and, and you look at the way that they do, they, they, they do church. And you look at all their old pictures back from the 1900s, and they're still doing church the same way that they've been doing it back in the early 1900s. And many times when you talk to these churches, when you talk about developing their congregation, when you talk about growing their congregation, whether it's in, it's, whether it's in a Hmong church, whether it's in the Anglo church, Filipino church, whatever, it doesn't matter. Churches that are dying have the same attitude towards church. And when you talk to people about these things, their solution is always Let's change the message of the gospel. It never dawns on them. It never dawns on them that maybe, maybe it is the tradition that you've been keeping all these years that is no longer relevant to the, your people. Maybe, just, just maybe, the gospel, is still the, the gospel is still relevant, but the way that you're, you're, you're doing church, 
Maybe these traditions are just no longer relevant. And maybe it's the traditions that needs to change. Maybe it's the traditions that have gone out of style. Maybe it's not the gospel. But it's so hard because we tend to hold on to our styles. We tend to hold on to our traditions for so long. It's like me trying to sell the best movie in the world on a VHS tape. No one's going to want to buy that, right? Or if they do, there's going to be very few people. And that's one of the heartaches that we as pastors and, and we who work in, 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 um, in, in congregational development at the conference, something that hurts us so much. Because it, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to convince us. And so Paul is talking about here is that the thing that we are to hold firmly to is the gospel. All these other things we can talk about. All these other things we can compromise. And Paul says, the gospel which you are saved, if you hold firmly to it. Paul is not saying that by, hold, by, by holding firmly to it, Paul is not saying that this is a salvation of faith plus works. I know the, the, the Protestant Reformation fathers, you know, oftentimes when they read scriptures like this, they found trouble in it. But Paul is saying here that Paul is saying that by holding firmly to the gospel, that this is the evidence of your faith. This is the evidence of your salvation. And those who are quickly deserting the gospel, they do so because there is no faith in their life. Because there is no salvation in their life. And Paul understood this. Paul understood what it means, what, what, what grace is all about. He says, but it is by grace of God I am who I am. He says this in this very same chapter. He says, he says that it is his grace to me. It is his grace to me. That, you know, he said, I worked harder than all of them, yet it is not I, but it is the grace of God that was with me. So he understood that he was saved. He understood that he was called by grace. And that grace resulted in him, in his good works, in his good deed. And that's all that it's all about. And we need to realize that, that what we do in the church, as pastors, as leaders, in the church, that this is a calling. That we are here because God has gave us a calling. And I shared this with us last week, that I truly believe that here in the United Methodist Church, God wants us to represent his kingdom, just as the vision that John, the Apostle Paul had when he was at the island of Patmos, when he looked before the throne of God and he saw nations, from people from different nations, from different cultures, from different ethnicities, from different groups coming together and worshiping God together. And that is our calling as the United Methodist Church. And that's what we need to, to move forward towards and we need to move forward to is that, is that, that picture of God's kingdom and that is our calling. And that's what we need to, to train our pastors to understand. That's what we need to train our leaders and our churches to understand that this that we are doing here, it is a calling. Pastors, this is not just a job. And many times we are trained in seminary. We're trained that, 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 that this is something we do from nine to five, but it is not. This is a calling. This is a calling. Something we do our whole entire life, every minute, every second of our life. And unless we know that, then we have not been called to the position of being a pastor in a church or being a leader in a church. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your message today. We thank you so much for the reminder that Paul shares with us this morning as he reminds us that all these things that we do, is, it is all about the gospel, Lord. And let us keep this at our hearts, Lord. Let us continue to serve you through this. Let us continue to proclaim the message of your son, Jesus Christ. And so we pray and we lift everyone here up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me if you're able to and turn to page 170, page 170, oh, how I love Jesus.
Praise the Lord. You may be seated at this time. There's one thing I forgot to announce for our, uh, for just, just, just for all of us to let us know that uh, we are having the Hmong uh, caucus meeting today on Zoom at 4 p.m. So those of you who uh, have time, you are more than welcome to join us for that. Let me know and I can send you the link to that Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, we will be discussing about the needs of all of our Hmong ministry throughout the California Nevada conference. And so... Uh, I am required to report back to the conference by the end of the month as to what those needs are. So the conference, we can start putting something together to help support our Hmong ministry. And so uh, we're doing this with all, uh, with all ethnic groups and things like that this year. So I just want to let us know that. So I do encourage you to, uh, to attend that. Okay, so Faith Hmong, Faith Caucus, Faith Hmong, Hmong, Shalat, or Plum Hmong, which I, Plum Hmong, Chong Du, and Yato Shou Zoom, and Fat Yon, and Shalat, and Yato, Okay, we'll be doing something different this week for our benediction, so please take out your um, bulletin. We'll be doing a responsive benediction, and so follow along with me. Remember the good news that we have received and proclaimed this day, the good news in which we stand and through which we are being saved. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said that he would. We are witnesses to this good news, and God commands that we do not keep this news to ourselves. We will testify to all that Christ has done. Amen and God bless.